Hello, my name is Donna Cathro. I am the director of the Onshore Seismic and Magneto Tellurics uh, section. And I'm here today to uh, welcome our speakers. Um, first of all, though, I will uh, do an acknowledgement of country. Uh, so Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders, past and present. So this morning we have two guest speakers. They're Dr Ruth Mur Murdy and Dr Huayu Yan. And their presentation is an overview of seismology at the Geological Survey of Western Australia. So seismological projects have been part of the operational research at GSWA for the past 10 years. Up until now, they've been quite low key, concentrating on imaging specific geological targets, such as the Capricorn origin, which investigates the collision between the Pilbara and Yilgarn cratons, the Albany, Albany, Albany Fraser origin and the southeast margin of the Yilgar craton, the Canning Basin and the area between Western Australian craton and the North Australian craton. These studies have been in conjunction with geological mapping, active seismic and magnetotellurics. Now, they are conducting longer term projects in, in conjunction with Geoscience Australia, such as baseline monitoring in the Canning Basin, seismicity of the Goldfields region and more detailed monitoring of the southwest seismic zone. However, the current big project, uh, which we'll hear a bit more about soon, is, uh, which is in the first year of, is the complete 40 kilometre coverage of Western Australia with passive seismic so stations known as WA Array. This continues the work that started in other parts of the country under Exploring for the Future program as Array. This is a 10 year project with, specific, with a specific list of products and a tight time frame and big ambitions. So, our two presenters today. First of all, we'll hear from Dr. Ruth Murdy. She is the manager of the Earth Imaging and Observation Group at the Geological Survey of Western Australia. Dr. Murdy started there 10 years ago as the 3D modeler and has been involved in most of the seismology projects at GSWA. Before joining GSWA, she spent some time in the mines in the Eastern Goldfields as an exploration geophysicist. She has also worked at the Comprehensive Nuclear T Test Ban Treaty Organisation in Vienna and as a lecturer at, in geophysics at Kiel University. Our second presenter today is Dr. Hyuan Yu Yan, and he is the lead seismologist of WA Array. Since receiving his PhD in geophysics from the University of Wyoming in 2007, he has worked in the field of earthquake seismology in the Berkeley Seismological Laboratory at the UC Berkeley and Macquarie University. Dr. Wan uh, joined GSWA in 2023, and he specialises in mapping structures of continental lithosphere. So I welcome Ruth to uh, start the presentation for today. Oh, thank you for your interest in the work that's going on in Western Australia. Um, this is a bit of a double act between myself and Huayu. Um, we've been working together for 10 years, so this is not all my own work. Um, you'll see how the teamwork has worked out. So, there are earthquakes in Western Australia. There's lots of them. Uh, you can see this is a plot of the earthquakes uh, in Western Australia over the past 10 years. And you'll notice there's a little, let's see, do I have a pointer on this? I've got a, can we see a, a, a cursor? If you can, it's up in the broom area on the northwest shelf. That is a little hot spot that's been going off for the past few, past few years. And the southwest seismic zone, the bait around Perth and to the south coast. I say we have lots of them. This is the, you know, the distribution we're getting. And they're not all small. There are big ones, that, uh, ones that disrupt the railway line and the Great Eastern Highway. For those of you who have never been across that side, that is the only railway line between us and the rest of Australia. It's the only major highway between us and the rest of Australia. And as last year we found out when it flooded, there's no food on the shelves in Woolworths. So it's important for us to keep this lifeline going. That was the Meckering earthquake of 1968 uh, and a magnitude 6.4, uh, 3, anyway, large enough to cause a serious amount of damage. Since then, this is the list of, I call, interesting earthquakes. It's not com com 
comprehensive. Um, and you'll notice the last big one we had was offshore broom 6.6. Um, that's one of the biggest ones on the Australian continent. Since then, if people were uh, awake at 5.30 WA time, 7.30 on Sunday morning, we had a 5.6 in Narangarop. So it's enough to... <clears throat> right, seismology projects. As I say, we've had, in the past 10 years, we've been running short, uh, specific target projects. We're not the first people have to have gone into Western Australia with seismometers. The black spot you see on the screen, that's the, the Australian National Network uh, run by Geoscience Australia and seems to be augmented quite a bit now by ourselves, but we'll come into that. The blue dots are other short-term research topics, mainly read by ANU, um, which have been uh, yeah, more than 10 years old now. The first one why you and I got involved in was the Capricorn Origin Passive Seismic Array. It happened to be in World Cup year, hence it got named COPA. It was a regional array of 87 uh, seismometers, and just in the sort of middle of it, there was a little high-resolution array at like six to four kilo, uh, two to six kilometers spacing. This was specifically to look at how the Pilbara and the Yilgarn came together across the Gascoigne uh, area. There was the Alfrex array. This was run in conjunction with the ANU uh, down on the Albany Fraser area. Um, we've done some more high resolution work with UWA with Mike Dentith there in the Perth Basin and across the Eastern Goldfields. Why you in conjunction with the uh, um, Chinese Academy of Sciences has been looking at a high resolution line along the Canning Basin and we worked with um, ANU to get some um, OBSs offshore. We're currently running with ANU and our uh, Department of Fire and Emergency Services an array down in Western Australia called the SWAN Array. And Huayu is actually now running array at the minute in the Pilbara. Let's have a look at these in a little more detail. As I say, the COPA array was specifically to look at how the Pilbara came together with the Yilgarn, uh, the two Archean cratons, and we have a Proterozoic orogenic belt in between them. And we're looking at can we see the relics of either crater on margins and what do the margins look like? So we used um, ambient noise signatures um, and that really helped us define where the different um, cratons finish and where the origin starts. Uh, if we look at the red and um, blue uh, plots on this side, we can see in the north, we see the Pilbara rift margin craton. In the south, we see the Yilgarn craton, which definitely have a very Archean signature, and we have the Proterozoic margin in between uh, with the um, Glenberg terrain. My speciality is to put this into 3D, with, and then we've put some of the major faults in the area on there, and you can see where we're really defining the edges of the Proterozoic origin. Uh, and then we've used a lot of receiver functions. This is the standard OSREM model and went of, of the MOHO, and we can see once we start adding all our 87 stations in there, we're really sort of more defining the features within the MOHO. The Alfrex array was run with GSWA and uh, ANU, and this was specifically to look at the, or at the uh, margin between the Yilgarn and its southeast, uh, that the Albany Fraser, which is actually reworked um, Yilgarn material. We'd shot an active seismic line across it. You can see that in the 3D representation. There's two lines in the south uh, and a big line across in the north. And we had this array of seismometers and we, from the receiver functions, we, um, we supported this idea that there is this offset, well, this uh, indentation into the MOHO at the edge of the Yilgarn. And this was then modeled in a 3D model with some gravity modeling to go with it. Canning Basin, who are you? You're gonna talk about this one. Okay, uh, thanks guys. So basically I'm just gonna show some um, modeling. So I'm on the modeling side of the project and these are more like uh, using conventional seismic um, uh, techniques to get uh, the, here the crustal structures. So basically we have this like over 800 uh, uh, kilometer array. I guess I can't point it. You can see it just along the coast of, of the Canyon Basin. Uh, with the, uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So roughly we have like 15, uh, 15 kilometer uh, station spacing and uh, on the right hand side, in the middle part here, 
uh, I show uh, first the ambient noise tomography of the crustal shear wave velocities. And then the middle part is the so-called uh, radio anisotropy. Basically, it just shows the, uh, the, the frozen in fabric, like blue for uh, horizontal and uh, red and uh, yellow for tilted or vertical fabrics in the crust. And then we have uh, conventional, uh, this is so-called CCP, uh, common conversion point uh, receiver function stacking, just to show the uh, intracrustal um, uh, discontinuities, like you see the moho around 30 to 40 uh, uh, kilometer depth, and also a crocodile shape structure down there. And the bottom there is just to uh, compare with active source line uh, shot in 14 or something like that. And then, okay, I have one more slide here. So this is the Pilbara railway deployed for the past two years. And uh, I guess at this time, I'm just gonna show you um, on the 13th of uh, November 21, there was this uh, magnitude six event, uh, which occurred near Marble Bar. That's that little uh, purple balloon. And then a visiting colleague of mine just did a quick analysis uh, using the, I think the, for this one, it's the, um, uh, the arrival, oh, sorry, let me think, <laughs> it's the P and S uh, ratio and the, the initial motion of P wave, like the up and downs to constrain the moment, the moment answer solution here. So uh, the bigger one on, on the right hand side, that's the, uh, that's the uh, uh, GA solution. And then the small one on the map, that's from this local array. And uh, I'll come back later for the w, some of the initial W array results. So the interesting thing about that earthquake, which you didn't pull out, was actually really deep. It's about 36 kilometers deep. It's actually bottom crustal. And uh, because we had our array there, we actually picked up a lot of the uh, aftershocks, uh, which is really interesting. We're still analyzing uh, more about that and see if we can bring more into the tectonics of what's going on in that area. The Swan Array, this is, I guess, with uh, ANU and our DFES, our Fire and Emergency Services, and we're trying to investigate the structure of the Yilgarn Craton. This is intraplate seismicity. There's no particular reason why we should have so much seismicity within the Yilgarn. Uh, and we're also obviously trying to work with the Fire and Emergency Services as to how we should appropriately respond, because they have nothing uh, in their procedures as to what to do in an earthquake other than go and look at it. So while we've had the Swan uh, array down, we had, uh, I think it was 5th of January last year, we had a um, magnitude uh, four in Arthur River, which is a tiny little group of farms down in um, southwestern Australia. Uh, and it was big enough to register on the national network. And we had the, obviously the Swan network down there, so we were able to actually uh, locate the um, the events much more clearly. As we can see in this picture here, um, the green ones are the GA uh, locations and the blue ones are our locations. Now, this actually is 10 kilometers difference. What does that mean? Well, it meant to the farmer that actually had his house right on top of the area and he'd got big cracks in his ceiling and he went to his insurers and say, this earthquake is causing me cracks in my house. And the local guy says, of course it did. I shall take it to the office and get you your compensation. Well, they took it to the further up office. And so they went online, saw the GA solution and said, it was more than 10 kilometers away. Of course, it can't have been caused by the earthquake. So he came back to us and said, what can you do about it? He says, well, here is our locations. And we could say why our location in this uh, instance was better. And luckily somebody had actually downloaded the INSAR and showed that there'd been a two centimeter uplift uh, displacement in that area. So that's the, the pictures at the bottom is the INSAR displacement. So we were working actually with GA because I think Dan provided those for me. And we continue to obviously to monitor that. That uh, swarm went on for like 15 months. Um, so, okay, the top one in green again is GA, bottom one is our locations. GA get bored if it's below two magnitude two. It's like too many of them, don't bother. But it, 
the main difference is you'll see ours are much way more clustered. I mean, this is basic seismology. If you've got more stations closer in, you're going to get more accurate um, locations. I was having a mess with this and trying to see if we've got such good locations, can we actually see a fault plane? Uh, so the, the, geomet uh, sorry, the geology here, you can see by the magnetics uh, down below, we've got a lot of um, north, west, south, east dikes. Most of that fabric you see in there is dikes, but if you see the offsets in it, the actual faulting in the area is north, east, south, west. So I put this into 3D, spun it round, and it looks like a fuzz. Sorry, no big punchline there. I <laughs> couldn't see the uh, fault plane. Okay, some of our longer term projects, and we, we'd like to run these for about 10 years ago. Um, when we started this, it was only myself at GSWA, and so they were, it's incrementally grown bigger. And I uh, was talking to Hugh at one of the conferences, and he says, I've got a bit of spare equipment. Well, I don't know how I managed to ask him this, but that somehow we established that there was some retired equipment at GA that we could trust how the interaction between GSWA and GA worked, if I could put some of the equipment in some of the interesting places that he would love to get to, but it's just too far away for him to come across, uh, if I could get data into, the net, in, into his um, monitoring system for him. So this started off our interest in the Southwest Seismic Zone. Since then, we've moved into the Canning Basin and into Kalgoorlie. So the Southwest Seismic Zone, we managed to get five pieces of kit from GA uh, as I say, it was an experiment, and I think, unfortunately, the station at Ongarup is showing the age of the equipment now. On Sunday, I went online, can I see the data at Ongarup, because it surely would have had a massive effect there, and um, no, it's not online anymore. Anyway, we've been working together for three years with this station in there. We've got five stations. We've got three in the northern wheat belt corridor, Wattening and Beacon, and we've got Ongarup down in the south. And we also, it's an, an interest from both um, Hugh and myself, is the seismicity in Kalgoorlie. Kalgoorlie, okay, so I have worked in the mines in Kalgoorlie, so I've got a little bit of local interest in there. Um, there's seismicity in the area, there's a magnitude 5.2, 13 years ago in 2010, and that had a big his, um, cultural impact because it knocked over buildings in Boulder, and we've lost that history now. We don't want that to happen again. Can, you know, we need to look at the seismicity in more detail. And it's not clear cut. It's not clear cut that mining produces seismicity in the gold fields. If you look at the length of the gold fields, let's look down in Norseman. Norseman will quite often put out a little swarm of mag magnitude fours. And then it'll go quiet again. Now there's mining down in Norseman, but that's all we see. Oops, wrong way. So Kalgoorlie will move up north. We know there's mining and we know the seismicity. Are they related? But then in between, we've got mines, like up in the north, there's like Sons of Gualia, is like over a kilometer deep. Very quiet. We're not getting seismicity from there. And I don't think it's just because we haven't actually got much monitoring up there. It is talking to the mines inspectors that go around, it's generally much quieter than anything in Kalgoorlie. So um, this is partly why we put a station in. Now, if you'll see from this um, the little map there, the only station that we had originally was at Cambalda. That's 70 kilometers south of town. And to um, try and pinpoint anything in the area, your next stations that are liable to um, constrain the northwards um, extent of the earthquake is Mikathara and Warakuna. They're hundreds of miles away. So we put one 20k north of town at Canona Bell. And the green spots in this map is the uh, earthquakes that happened, um, this is two years ago now, in the area. And you can see they're quite, there's quite a spread to them. Once we started that northern constraints in Canona Bell, um, they, they clustered a lot closer. So this was looking really exciting till somebody went and stole the seismometer. <laughs> this is Kalgoorlie for you. <laughs> anyway, we're not deterred. Um, we're back in the region. We're currently running uh, five more stations. So we've got one up at Menzies. Um, we've got one in Coolgardy. We've got one right in Hannon Street in a cellar. And then we've got two more stations on, on pastoral leases, which have been running. And you'll see from the, an event of 1.7 a couple of weeks ago um, that these stations are picking it up. They're locating it pretty nicely. Um, the something we're suffering from is Telstra. 
rearranging their network. And so two of the stations have just been you know, excluded. So we're gonna to have to work out how to get that station data back into the network. And we've also now put one a bit further out at Tropicana, which is hopefully pushing out into that sort of like central Australian zone, covering a bit of a blank spot we've had out there. Kimberley. Um, you'll see the little pink squares on the map. These are petroleum licenses. And so some of them are actually active. I know that Buru are currently um, pumping hydrocarbons out of that area. But this is one of the political hotspots um, where people have asked, can they frack? So at, at the stage where we were developing this, um, there were two applications in to put in test wells for fracking. Uh, and this was a conversation I had with my director one Christmas lunchtime saying, and he was saying, there's no earthquakes in the Kimberley. And I'm saying, you don't know because nobody's monitoring them up there. Uh, so that said, his response to that was, I want a proposal on my desk next week, please. So anyway, this has ended up with 12, we've added to the stations already up there, another 12 stations, which again, GA are hosting for us. Um, so we're doing baseline monitoring. We are not monitoring fracking because there is none yet. We will not monitor it with this network, it's incorrectly spaced, but we want to establish what the baseline seismicity is so that if fracking happened, we can then compare when and where and how. So uh, yeah, it's a mixture of on Telstra and on satellite dishes. So that was quite a new adventure for us, putting up satellite dishes. But then Hugh took great joy in January telling me, your station's underwater and here's your flooding map. Mm -hmm. um, and as we went to what luckily only one station went up, to, uh, but it was literally, I think it must have been under right up to its mast. You can see the, in the photo, the flood line, it was right above the solar panel regulator. And I think that's just because it couldn't push any more air out of the top. Um, we're looking to move that station. However, credit to the people we uh, got the equipment from, the digitizer uh, worked as soon as we put more power on it. So anyway, something to be aware of. So what we're trying to do is, uh, as part of a GSWA project, so it's not just myself, um, we have been trying to put all the data coming in from this, especially the MOHO, that's one of the obvious things to put in, is um, build a 3D model and then put all our data into these 3D models. So we have, um, with GA, shot a lot of active seismic lines. So this data has gone in, that's all your, your little lines on the, the top left corner there. From that information, I have then put in the major crustal boundaries, which is your blue um, lines there, trying to get the appropriate um, dips and strikes. And it's amazing how geologists think in two dimensions, and when you put it in a third dimension, something doesn't quite work. So we had a real good brainstorming across the whole um, survey to get this model to work. Um, so we've got, an, uh, when you go onto the, the right-hand side, the top um, corner is the, the, the surface, blocks and then underneath is what we think about the lowest crustal blocks and yet that's actually fairly well made up this is hypothesis some of it we've seen in the deep crustal seismics otherwise otherwise we don't know much about it and we will hopefully be looking into this as we take our next project across the country the one thing we started with this was this was moho picks from the active seismic lines you can see the Moho picks from the Capricorn, from the Albany Fraser, from all those projects I've just talked to you about. We've added into the Osram. I tended to sort of take out the Osram where we actually had real data, but in the areas we don't have Osram is the best we've got. Uh, and so we've built a Moho model and hope that fully as our next project moves through the um, state, it will become more detailed. Here we go. This is the new big exciting project of the WA Array. It's seismology and hopefully we'll start getting the MT running. I know G have put a few MT stations in and we hope to build on that. So a lot of WA is undercover uh, and there's this big push for new mines for um, minerals that will help us transfer into a zero carbon economy. Um, so we need to look at the whole mineral systems theory. Uh, we need to look at undercover and this is not a new thing. It's building on Oz Array stations and other seismic monitoring that's been done in the rest of the country. And I won't get into my little political high horse, but as usual, when it comes to WA, we sort of do it ourselves. I don't need to go into the why we need to do it. You guys have, uh, you know, GA was instrumental in, in this theory that 85% of um, 
mineral deposits sort of lie within the gradient in the lithosphere. Um, the lithosphere apparently has been mapped in WA. I'm not quite sure how, anyway. So minerals located between crustal blocks, different crustal blocks, different crustal blocks have different ages, therefore different thicknesses. So therefore we need to map down to the base of the lithosphere. And it's something that we haven't actually done as GSWA up till now anyway. And where it has been done, it's been done pretty sparsely by other groups. So I don't need to preach to you guys, passive seismic and NT are the two of the few methods of investigating deep below the crust into the sub-lithospheric continental mantle and the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. So we're going to try and aim these two in conjunction, if we can, together. How are we going to do this? Receiver functions from teleseismic earthquakes using PNS waves. Our receiving area for useful um, teleseismums that you see with the world centered on Australia, as it should be. Um, we got a lot of earthquakes obviously happening around the north of Australia and down around the, um, the east and the southeast. And then there's little bits of uh, um, seismicity happening along the south and the west. So we have to take what we can there. You know, Australia is where it is. And we can just see this is the, the actual receiver function arrivals is from our high resolution array in uh, the Capricorn origin. And we can see the different arrivals coming through and how we've managed to pick our, our MOHO depths from that. Uh, so we'll be doing ambient noise tomography. We've seen some examples in Huayu's work already. And then we're going to move on to do more sort of full waveform body wave tomography uh, as we go. Other national surveys, as I say, this is not new. The USA array, which then moved up into Canada and the Cordillera array. ALP array, we've heard from some of those when we went to uh, China with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. They're working with these and the Tethys. So we're trying to um, follow the examples they've had. Uh, probably lesser known, the um, array in Iberia, in Spain, Portugal, and the Chinese array. And of course, Oz array, as run by GA. This is what I think you've currently got out at the minute. This is a two, approximately a 200 kilometer spacing, and that's running across the whole continent. 200 kilometers wasn't good enough for us. 50 kilometers wasn't good enough for us. Who are you managed to talk us into do a 40 kilometer spacing? Mm -hmm. There is actually a fairly logical rationale for this in the MOHO because it's Archean is actually quite shallow. For a receiver function, your cone of influence uh, is, is what happens to define the MOHO. If we want a dimple-free MOHO, we actually have to raise, oh, sorry, close the spacing down so that we get it dimple-free. As you can see, this is an example from our data in the Canning Basin, from our Canning Array, where you've got about a 40 kilometer uh, array we can get a dimple-free moho. The footprints actually overlap. Once you spread it out to about 50 kilometers, you're sort of getting gaps between. So therefore, we've closed it down. I wasn't particularly amused because my original calculation of 50 kilometer spacing, which a lot of the other Oz Array or your Beetaloo areas have been using, um, that would have given me 950 points. We're now up to 150 points we have to cover if we are going to cover the whole state at 40 kilometer spacing, which is our aim. We've set out doing that. Let's hope we get there. So this is a long-term project. We are currently in the southwest. This orange area down the bottom is where we have 165 stations at the minute. Luckily, there's a high density of the national network stations, so that was a bit easier for us. Um, so we split the area, the, the state, into nine regions, and we'll progressively move across the state if we can. Next year, we will move into the green area, the Goldfields to Geraldton region. And then things start to get really interesting as we head into the pink area in the Central East, which is mainly desert. So this is a 10 years. It's really ambitious. This is my time frame. Uh, this is the, the, the areas on the side. And you'll see the green is when it's in the field. The blue is when we're going to do the process and we're going to run through. It is our aim to make sure this data becomes public. So our team is going to really nail some basic products, which will come out with the report and the data after one year. That is our aim. There won't be much finesse and the tectonic models will flow later, but the data will be uh, available to people to do their own computations and calculations on it and to come up with other things. We hope you'll work with us in doing that. So our equipment is, is quick, quick installations. We've got just a little um, seismometer. Our vault is actually a terracotta pot with a tube over the top of it. Power supplies, a little battery with um, solar panel. It's all standalone, 
So we're running around after six months uh, to pick up the data and then again. So we, ha we ha are worried about loss of data. So that's partly why we've done it close to us. We actually went out after three months just to check how we were going. As a team, this is our first big high profile array. We're doing all right. We're getting about sort of 88% data retrieval, which I was actually really happy with. WA, some of it's really nice. This is one of my lovely stations with, uh, it happens to be in springtime with the, uh, the, that's not buttercups, little yellow flowers. It's a really pretty station up there. We can drive in. Other ones, uh, certainly when we get to the desert, we're gonna be flying. And in WA, that could be as much as 50% of the total WRA stations. It's gonna be fun. So as I say, we're gonna have the, the instruments on the ground for one year. We're gonna go around every six months to pick up the data. The data QA, QC is going to be very important. Uh, standard products pushed out once a year, and the uh, data will also be available at the end of the year. And then we will work with people and internally with our own geologists to put out more tectonic models. Products, what sort of things are we going to try and aim to put out? Cover thickness, depth to moho, lithospheric thickness, various crustal wave speed models, uh, we can hopefully get a strain map and the local seismicity and catalog. That's our sort of basic list of products. And they'll just be issued as a digital layer through our GeoView uh, portal. As I say, phase one has gone in. Uh, that went in in December and will come out this December. Just a couple of nice picks. Um, we are integrating with the Oz Array. We're trying to coordinate and currently we're actually looking after 11 of their stations. It is what they call a Portuguese house of an array, which means we've got seven different types of seismometer and digitizer. And that's just, uh, we just got the money really quickly and we had to scramble to get whatever instruments we've got. So we are trying to do a huddle test um, just to try and calibrate things. And Hugh's brought up some interesting issues with calibration, just to make sure all our calculations are based on the same level. Um, Calibration test isn't actually going that well at the minute because you see, you see it's, it's parked on carpet, which is just horrendous. Anyway, we'll move on. We will. One of the important things about the QAQC on this is to try and make sure all our instruments are giving an appropriate uh, response. So we've had we're in, entering negotiations with GA as to whether they could possibly leave out some of their Oz array stations for the duration of WA as a sort of backbone. So you'll see um, the green areas here is what is available by T Telstra, to put things on Telstra. Of course, all the one, uh, stations I want to keep are the orange ones, which are nowhere near the green areas. That would be too easy. So currently we're looking at satellite modems. And actually these days, these little pictures here is two modems we're currently running at our test center. Um, and they're sending data fine. So we're going to see this on the Starlink network. We're investigating how that's going to go. Just a, this is just one of our little show pieces. We had an Arthur River earthquake. This is this year. So as I said, the Arthur River I was talking about earlier, that was all last year. But it threw up another 4.1 um, in February this year. And that's the nice big earthquake there. And you can see a couple of little earthquake um, aftershocks. In that same window, you see the Turkey event of February coming through. I just think that's a really nice example of our data. And that's recorded on one of these little uh, mobile stations we've got. And of course, we had to talk about now anger up. Uh, that was the one Sunday morning. Um, the uh, red uh, beach ball is the focal mechanism as per GA. And the, um, the blue one is from the USGS, not actually so different. And if we look at the strain map across uh, the Yilgarn, all the um, ones actually in the Yilgarn, we all have much the same mechanism. They're all basically a thrust mechanism. You'll see the ones down in the Albany Fraser, that's the black spots, they tend to be a bit more strike slip. Um, anyway, it's good, it conforms, it's nice. Right, who are you? You can talk about this. Okay, so this one, uh, so basically, I guess, like Ruth just mentioned, uh, after the first uh, data service, data download, we have about almost 90, I would say, 90% of uh, data retrieval. And we also recognize a lot of uh, problems like uh, GPS 
timing issues, or leap second problems. But these ones are, I guess, it's it's good to we we see, we saw that in the first service, and then we actually uh, asked the companies to give us the firmware. So these are all applied to the uh, all these stations in the second service. I mean, before the second service. So everything should be all correct now. So now I'm just showing some quick examples like, uh, okay, the WRA uh, team uh, already started the uh, data QC for two downloads we have. And here I'm just playing with, you know, some of the good, very good events, like to, to, to show you guys how, how good the, 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 the quality, the data quality is. Here is a, a Northern Maluka Sea event occurred on January 18th, uh, which is like roughly between 32 to 39 degrees off the uh, center of the WRA phase one. Um, again, that's the USGS solution. So here I'm just showing two uh, waveforms, vertical component waveforms. So uh, the top one is the permanent station Mikathera. The bottom one is one of the, our WRA stations. So re very nice waveform, although our uh, guest waveforms, waveform has a little bit in you know, a pre-event much, much higher, slightly higher <laughs> noise level. Um, so this is just to show all the vertical component of WRA uh, stations for this event. So the aim is, okay, where you see, so this is between minus 50 second of the uh, theoretical peer arrival to 100 sec, plus 100 second, uh, and 100 second uh, after the peer arrival. And then using this, we can actually uh, grab the first moho uh, traces. So these uh, uh, is like 140 something stations sorted by the uh, the moho arrival time. So this is the reserve function moho time, a bit like shear wave, shear wave uh, arrival time. Um, and then just based on the arrival time, we can apply some sort of background model. In this case, I think I used uh, uh, not 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 that yet. So basically, I can use this to form some contour of the moho. Um, now this one is time, and then after I apply a background velocity model, I can get the moho of this region. See, this is just for one event, and we have a pretty good result already. And then this next one is from a different uh, earthquake. This is uh, earthquake on. April 14th, uh, it's a very deep one. It's almost 600 kilometer depth. But uh, the nice thing about this one is it provides uh, uh, very clean shear waves. Like in this case, we can apply the so-called shear wave splitting to show the anisotropy fast axis directions, just to, uh, like what I plotted here. So red and, and blue, these are just to show, okay, one, the majority is like east-west, just like the dikes in Western Australia here, and uh, uh, blue is north-south. And also, this one, just to show we have, let's say just use the first data download, we can, we already start to, to see um, uh, surface waves from ambient noise uh, cross-correlation. The top is the radio wave, the bottom is the uh, love wave. Um, yes, <laughs> all yours. So that's, I hope that's given you a bit of an overview of what we've been doing, some of the projects we've been involved in. Um, yeah, so I'd like to say thank you for GA for helping us set out on this path, and hopefully we'll work well together in the future. Anyway, any questions? <laughs>